Well, as uh, Connor mentioned, I've been in recruit for a number of years, so just looking to impart some of my knowledge uh, to you in the horticulture sector. So um, we're going to keep this fairly simple. Um, we're going to keep this uh, fairly simple and we're just going to walk through the entire process from start through to finish uh, of the full recruitment cycle process and my thoughts and advice on different elements of this particular um, system. So as uh, Connor mentioned, I work with horse recruiter. We just specialize in horticulture recruitment. Um, so that was obviously the theme for tonight's discussion. So today we're going to break this down into three main categories, how best to run your recruitment process. So this would be from start to finish. So from when you decide you want to start uh, recruiting for something all the way through to when you onboard somebody and eventually offboard them as needed. We're also going to look at key elements of writing a job description or a job ad um, and how to best uh, engage with your candidates and why you should approach it in certain ways over others. We're also going to look at brand awareness. So this is something that's a bit of a paradigm shift in recruitment over the last five to six years. So it's become more and more apparent as people engage with social media that people have a wealth of knowledge about your company before they even speak to you. So we're going to use that and we're going to look at that and how we can actually capitalize and make sure that we put our best foot forward and make sure that you get the best candidates and top talent uh, through your own brand. Um, so like I said before, we're going to look at how best to run your recruitment process. I've, bro I've broken this down into three different categories. So uh, what to do before you even start recruiting, uh, what to do while you are actually recruiting, and what you should do after you've just finished recruiting and how best to do that. Um, so this is what you need to start thinking about when you are actually going to recruit. So this is before you even, you know, pick up the phone and talk to anybody about, you know, job ads or talk to any recruiters or even potentially talking to some of your staff uh, about hiring needs. Um, so the first thing you need to think about is what is the purpose of your role? So this is actually quite important because nine times out of 10, when I'm speaking to somebody as a, you know, when they're my client looking to hire new staff, they haven't fully realized exactly what the role is and half, half the journey is almost figuring that out for them. You'll be at such a huge advantage if you know exactly what the purpose of that role is within your organization. You know, what are the objectives? What are you looking to have that person accomplish, you know, within your organization? Um, now you start thinking about timelines. Um, typically, when I'm working with somebody, it needs that person needs to have started that job yesterday, you know, as soon as possible. Um, if you are able to plan ahead and predict exactly when you need somebody, you can you can work more efficiently and prioritize your time accordingly and make sure that the time that you invest into your recruitment process is fruitful. So this is coming back to talking about the purpose of your role. So how will this work within your current team structure? So who will this person be working with? Will they be over people? Will they be under people? How will personalities potentially work together? So this is when you need to realize, you know, what your team is made up of. For example, if you have people who are more softly spoken, you know, maybe having somebody who is more upfront and uh, in your face may not necessarily be a good mix to have with that particular person and vice versa. There's lots of different things you need to consider before um, looking at particular uh, personality types and how they can interact with your team. If you have an understanding of this before you even um, start the process, uh, that means when you're having a call with somebody on the phone or having you know that first in you know that first conversation with them, it just makes it so much more streamlined. You can strike off people as needed. You don't have to worry about heartache down the road. So this is something thing that not a lot of people think about um, when they start the recruitment process, you know, whether it's going to be permanent versus temporary. Um, I find horticulture is a little bit of um, an outlier when it comes to different types of roles. Uh, generally speaking, people come to me about permanent positions, um, whereas when they talk about temporary positions, they tend to be quite seasonal. Um, so, you know, whether or not there's a there's work, there's a particular project that's coming in or whether there's a specific uh, amount of work that needs to be done at a certain time of year. Um, but most people tend to think about permanent positions as, you know, right, you know, I'm committed to this, let's go forward. Um, but I would advise people just to think about, you know, what does your role really need? 
um, you know, whether or not it does need to be permanent versus temporary. Because if you have an understanding of that before you start the recruitment process, it can set expectations, you know, when you're talking to people, you know, uh, they go in knowing exactly what it is uh, that is on offer for you. So this is what you need to think about when you are actually doing the hiring. So this is where this is where a lot of juggling needs to happen. Um, you know, because you may have multiple hiring processes going on at the same time. Um, you know, you may be at an interview stage at one, offer with another, um, or just starting the interview process altogether um, with a different role. So these are some things that you need to start juggling together uh, while you are doing uh, this entire process. Um, so how many steps would you have in your interview process? I would always recommend a, min a minimum of two. Uh, the first one is more of an exploratory maybe call or meeting, depending on how you specifically want to set it up. So this is not necessarily um, a strict interview kind of step. It's more like an informal process. Um, it's like you're getting to know that person. You see who they are. You know, what do they represent? You know, do they have the general skills of what you're looking for? Um, and then I would have a follow up, you know, assuming that goes well, I would have a follow up interview um you know uh, just to explore right you know this is exactly what we're looking for you know how would you react in x y and z if you're given a b and c so it's a lot more um focused on that one so i would i'd recommend keeping it fairly open you know uh keeping it open-ended you know finding out more about the person and then if you're interested and they're interested i'll then start funding into more specifics at that point so how will you conduct your interview process? This is something that I have done quite a lot of work with um, outside of Horsey Recruit. Um, I talk to a lot of candidates, you know, how their experience is with their, with, their, um, with their career. And what I'm finding is that a lot of people are getting potentially put off by um, particular ways of being asked questions, whether or not they would be inappropriate um, or maybe they might be uncomfortable. Uh, for example, I actually did a poll over the last couple of weeks um, of 2,600 people and 64% uh, of that's over two thirds uh, or close to two thirds, sorry, um, that would be potentially put off uh, by, by a, a company presenting uh, inappropriate questions. Um, so, so it's very, very important to make sure that um, when you're asking questions that they're not deemed to be inappropriate for that particular person. Um, and one thing to obviously bear in mind is there are, of course, uh, nine uh, protected characteristics um, when it comes to asking questions at interview. Uh, and these would be age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, pregnancy, race, religion, sex, and sexual orientation. So those are nine protected, protected characteristics uh, that, um, that, that uh, everybody has, regardless of where they are in the world. So if you discriminate, based on any of those and it could be and, and nine times out of ten it's done unintentionally but if you do discriminate based on any of those nine prote protected characteristics that that could potentially land you in hot water and um, so I would always advise you know that you have a set of questions or a set of general type of questions that you want to have a, uh, answered by the end of the interview um, so you know exactly uh, what, where that person stands on uh, these particular questions and you're not potentially wandering into uh, dangerous waters. Um, so this is who needs to be involved in your interview process. So there's a difference between who wants to be involved in your interview process and who needs to be involved in your interview process. So at this particular point, you need to think about, you know, who actually needs to be here, you know, to make this decision. You know, um, it'd be great if they met every uh, Tom, Dick and Harry in, 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 in the business. Um, but, you know, who, who will this person be interacting with and uh, who do they actually need to speak with um, in order to make sure that this, uh, this hiring process works out for them? Um, and then this leads into how adaptable are you while interviewing? Um, so people are, you know, people interview obviously outside, you know, uh, you know, on their own time. So, you know, they put time aside to come and meet you, uh, put time aside to do their application. And obviously, people's time really matters. Um, and this comes back to another poll that I did earlier on uh, this week for 2100. You know, 89% of the candidates said that they were going to interview that they were invited to. You know, obviously, there will be some people who just won't turn up, 
we've all had that heartache. Um, you know, but generally speaking, the vast majority of people will put time aside and come see you um, if they if you have invited them for interview. So put time aside and stick to that time um, to make sure that people feel appreciated when they come to see you. So this is um, this is more about you know how to finish up your interview process. So an interview is, is like a sales process. You know you have your your hook, your middle, and your end. You know so you, you're looking to make that close, make that sale, as it were. You know having this person invest in your business. Um, so that is what this is all about. So. References is something that I am quite, uh, I feel quite strongly about because um, I'm sure we've all been in the situation whereby, you know, you're, you, you've taken on somebody, you know, they, they, they've worked out really well, they seem like they're working really out really well for you, but then something comes up, you know, skeletons come out of the closet and you're there thinking, oh my God, why did I do this? Um, you know, and that's where references, you know, become really, really useful. So whenever I'm doing a recruitment process, I always take references, regardless of their particular uh, role, whether it be internal or with a client. Um, and then I have a note here saying oral versus written. Um, I personally never take written just because they're just easy to fake. You know, take a logo, put some nice fancy words on it, you know, pretend to do a signature. They're, they're just very easy to fake. So I would always take an oral reference. Um, However, when I was working in the UK, I worked in both London and uh, Glasgow. Uh, so when I was working in the UK, I was aware that it's actually, you're not allowed to give a negative reference, and I understand that, but there are certain walkarounds you can do with that. Um, so you can ask the simple question, you know, would you rehire this person if given the opportunity? If they say no, that says all you need to know, really. Um, you know, you can read in between the lines without having to make sure that, um, you know, putting them in an uncomfortable position and answer something that could potentially land them in hot water. So I would always definitely recommend taking on references. So what is your offer process? You know, is it a simple case of you do a verbal offer and then send over a contract, you send a contract and then you do a verbal offer? You know, how you do it obviously is, um, is, is ultimately up to you. I find the best way that it works is you send the offer verbally over the phone. Um, you get their confirmation. Do you accept this offer? Yes or no. If they say yes, obviously happy days, you know, go on ahead. If they say no, at least you know where you stand. If they're thinking about it, you know, give them give them a day or two to think about it. Um, but I wouldn't give them any more than that because if they're taking more than two days to think about an offer, either they're not um Either they're not particularly interested in your offer or there's something holding them back. Um, so I'd reach out after definitely less or definitely at the 48 hour mark and say, hey, you know, what, what's going on? What do you think? Um, you know, and there may be something you need to iron out there. And another thing to think about are counter offers. So a counter offer is when you are being made an offer by an employer, you go to hand in your notice your notice and then the um, then the company you're working for then make a counter offer to counter offer obviously the offer you've just been made a lot of times I said offer there um, but counter offers are the bane of recruitment of, of, of any recruitment uh, process because what happens is you know that person they might just feel more comfortable that person would then be counter offered by their employee of their current employer they may be offered more money or what have you um, then suddenly, you know, it just all falls through. And the reason why this is so important is because out of a poll of 1,800 people I, I, I spoke with, uh, no, more than a third said they would at least consider a counter offer. So this is something that you need to have a conversation with um, early on, you know, when you're talking to somebody. So this is coming back to what I was saying before with a guy keeping the conversation pretty open when you initially speak with candidates. Um, so this is whereby you, you know, say, hey, what's going on? You know, why are you looking to leave? Um, you know, what, what, can, what can a potential new employer give you? Um, and those kind of open questions can help kind of map out exactly how that kind of process is thing and how they, you know, what they value and what you can potentially offer that person. Because if that candidate goes back after you've made an offer and says, hey, you know, my boss just asked to give me a counter offer, you can say, hey, well, you said you're looking to work more um, within this area. This is what this job is offering. Um, so you're able to 
almost like remind them why they're looking to leave um you know and it helps kind of mitigate that and also if people are expecting a counter offer they're less likely to be you know taken by surprise be put on the spot when they go to hand in their notices so preempting people is obviously um much uh, very ideal in that sort of situation so this is coming back to you know when you are looking to start the recruitment process you know what are you willing to negotiate on you know is it working from home is it a higher salary is it a maybe benefits um is it you know more more sick pay is it learning opportunities you know that th th these are the sort of things you need to think about um while you are getting ready to make your offer because there may come a point where you're talking with a candidate you absolutely love for whatever reason and they have a particular sticking point and um, that they're just really like you know that they're, they're just stuck on it um, it could be, for example, I find an awful lot of uh, work-life balance, and that actually brings up uh, the next point here. You know, from a poll of 1,200, you know, 68% of candidates ranked higher, you know, their work-life balance than money when considering a new offer. So, you know, that, that's, again, more than two-thirds of candidates are saying, you know, work-life balance is more important to me than money. So, if you can, if you can prove you can offer that particular um you know that particular benefit uh to, to that uh, it, to that candidate that just makes your opportunity so much more enticing than if their current employer just comes back and says hey here's you know an extra five grand um you know that people are just much more attracted today to having much better work-life balance at present so onboarding is something that is very important as well um so th this is coming back again to your planning process you know when we were talking about you know how do you how does this person interact with the team how they're going to fit in your you, you know your your, your um, organizational structure you know what's the purpose of the role so this all culminates to the onboarding process so when that person accepts your offer and they're getting ready to start they should know what you expect on day one what you expect by the end of the week, what they should be looking at to do by the end of the month, and where they should be at at six months, if this is obviously a permanent position. Contract is a whole other thing altogether. Um, if it's contract, obviously it's milestones, you know, it's uh, right, this is what we're looking to achieve, da, 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 here you go. Um, but an, a new employee who's been taken on should, should know exactly what to expect. Um, they shouldn't feel like that they you know, they're walking on the first day, it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, I would highly advise that some sort of training program, you know, some sort of induction program be established in your company. Um, even if it's just as simple as showing someone around the office the first day, you know, I know when I first started working, um, you know, in recruitment way back when, you know, the first thing they did was they just brought me around the building, you know, they introduced me to people. Um, I just moved from a new city and everything else. So I found that extraordinarily, extraordinarily useful. Um, you know, just being shown around, you know, where the bathrooms are, you know, where, 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 um, where, where the equipment was. Um, so that, that sort of thing can be very useful. And then at the end of the day, that particular, that new employee of yours should know what would be expected of them going forward. So we're going to look at um, the second part of this particular uh, little seminar, which is looking at how to write a, an effective job advertisement. Um, this is something that is often cast aside, uh, both by recruiters and by companies, uh, much to their detriment, I feel. Um, so these are the four things that I would recommend that you would always bear in mind when thinking about writing about an effective job advertisement you know think about what you like about working where you are you know is it the people is it the projects you know what 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 makes where you're working special you know like uh, what 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 makes you proud about where about where you're working um because because you should always you know, you should always incorporate those kind of thoughts, you know, into your job advertisement, you know, be, be proud about what you do, you know, and talk about it in your job advertisement. Um, and then this sort of relates to the next uh, question, which is about the role itself. You know, what, what makes the role special? What, what, what will you be doing? What, what, makes, what would make somebody, you know, want to do what they're doing? 
Um, now, one thing I will say, you know, and I appreciate this is a valid criticism, that sometimes, you know, roles just need to be filled. You know, sometimes they just need to be, you know, they just need a body in there and get, get going. And, and that's absolutely fine. You know, and sometimes you, there, there's just no way to make the role kind of sound, you know, for, for want of a better word, cooler than it is. Um, so that's why you fall back on, you know, the, the, the culture of the place, you know, the project that you're working on. So you're just talking about, you know, what, where, where the, uh, about, about the company at that point. Um, if there's one thing you do take away from this uh, li little talk I'm giving you today, it's this point here. Tailor your job towards your audience. Include the reader in your journey. This is not about you. You know, we're, we're in what's called a candidate poor market, and I'll go into more detail on that later on. Um, but what you're trying to do with this job ad is get people to apply for that role. You know, you're trying to get people engaged, excited, and want to put themselves forward for that role. So when you're writing your job ad, you know, you can't think about, you know, what's in it for me. You have to think about what's in it for them. You know, so just think about that whenever you are writing your job ad. And the last thing, it's small, but it's very important. It's just a call to action. You know, so in any sales role that anybody ever does, any sales writing or anything else, you always have a call to action. You're, you're encouraging people to take the next step. In this case, it's apply or it's get in touch or it's uh, send an email or it's call. You know, so you always want to make sure that um, you have people, you know, um, engage. And then once they're engaged, they're able to move on to the next action. And you need to encourage that action as much as possible. Um, so this is just a continuation on of that. Um, so this is coming back to what I was saying before. You get what you put in. A poorly written ad will get poorly qualified applicants. Um, I, 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 I'm as guilty as this. Um, when I first started, you know, I put no effort at all into uh, writing job ads. I was so busy, I just copied and pasted, you know, very basic job ads. And I was getting really frustrated, you know, what, why I couldn't find people, um, you know. But once I realized myself, you know, putting a bit of effort into writing a job, it could take 15, 20 minutes, you know, um, on a good day. Sometimes you can take an hour, an hour and a half. But putting the time aside to write a really good job ad, you know, you do reap the benefits. So, and then once you have finished reading your job ad, you can just take a step back. You know, take a step back, you know, and, uh, you know, look, look at your job, you know, think, would you actually apply for this if you were that candidate? You know, because sometimes people just, like I said before, they rush things together and it just doesn't quite work out for them. Um, because, you know, it, it, there might be grammatical errors, there might, it might just not read quite right, or it might just be really boring language that you're using. Um, you know, people just don't get excited about it and they just don't feel like they should bother applying because they're just not engaged. And that brings us to the last point, you know, writing is a skill, you know, you wouldn't bring someone in, um, you know, to, uh, to do do an architectural drawing if they don't have the relevant qualifications. Uh, writing is that particular skill as well. You should outsource it if necessary. Um, you know, have have a writer on hand, you know, so whenever you need that job description written up, you know, you have somebody, you have somebody who can craft that for you. Um, you know, put, you know, that person will would be able to put put pull together an ad for you and in, 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 a, in an effective way and make sure that it engages with people the way it needs to be engaged with. So what we're going to look at now is the job ad I wrote about maybe two months ago. Um, so we successfully filled this position and we, you know, we had a really good response. We had about 200 odd applicants, um, you know, apply for this particular role. So I know this job ad works. Um, so I'm going to walk you through um, exactly, you know, why it worked. And uh, I'll, be, I'll point out specific things, you know, for you to think about uh, to make sure that um, you got exactly uh, what, what I was trying to do. So I kept this fairly simple. You know, I didn't go, um, I didn't add too many frills or anything else. You know, I, kinda, I was kind of straight to the point. Um, so I had sat down with my colleagues and uh, we had decided that we needed a certain someone to join our team. And so we sat down for a good, you know, hour and a half, two hours, say, right, you know, what do we want this person to do? 
how do we want them to do it and how they fit in with the team. So I went through the whole process that I was explaining to you before about uh, making sure that the person that we take on will fit in with what we need. So you will notice that when I start off with this job description, I have three questions, three very close questions. Are you interested in working in a largely untapped market that involves little to no cold calling? So just for, just for reference, this is the sales specialist role. Um, so this is very much sales role. Um, so I, I, we had decided that we didn't want somebody who, who, who really wanted to burn themselves out. We want somebody who really enjoyed sales, but wanted to be passionate about what they were doing without feeling the need to burn themselves out. But the first question targets that. It makes sure that whoever's applying is thinking about, I don't really want cold calling. You know, I just want something that I'm passionate about. Then the next one, we, you know, are you interested in taking control of your work week? You know, it's asking that person who's reading, you know, um, you know, are you are you capable of being independent? Are you capable of taking control? Because um, we were in a position that we're very much macro managers that we don't have time to take um, somebody by the hand and uh, walk into every little thing. We needed somebody who was comfortable with uh, taking control of their own work. Then last but not least, you know, have you got a passion for working with plants in your garden? You know, talking about the um, talking about this, the sector itself. Then of course, this leads on to a soft close, you know, if so, read on. So you've, you've asked all those questions, you've got that person thinking about, you know, does this apply to me? Yes, it does. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. So then we just start talking about the actual role itself. You know, we have, it's obviously a fantastic opportunity using that kind of language to jazz it up a little bit. Um, you see that I've mentioned the, co the company name, you know, we've explicitly said that this is a 15 hour um, part time uh, role per week um, and then just tell you a little bit more about the role. So just getting that person, getting that person um, engaged with what the kind of role is. Um, so at that point, you bring them on to the job, job requirements. So this is so at this point of, the, of reading the ad, the person should start thinking that they are um, right. This is a good match for me. I want to find out more. Um, well, what what does this what does this entail? So this is when you start bringing them on to right. You know, in order in order to succeed, you need X, Y, and Z. So this is what this is how we laid it out. So I kept it fairly conversational. We said, like all jobs, there are requirements for this role. However, we wish to stress that for this role, attitude is extremely important for this job. Uh, if you have the right attitude needed to really make this opportunity your own, then we would still love to talk to you. So the reason why we put that caveat in there is because of soft skills. So this is something that has become increasingly important throughout the entire economy. Um, skills are being updated, you know, industries are being updated. Everything is moving a lot more fast than it used to. Um, so a lot more quickly, I should say, than it used to. So we need to be able to make sure that we have people who are adaptable, who are able to change with the times. Um, you know, and some, and, and that's uh, classified as, you know, being really skilled with soft skills. Um, so that's why we have that caveat in there. So these are the list of requirements that we had for this particular role. We kept it nice, short and sweet, you know, nothing uh, too, too complicated. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, or two things I want, I want to highlight. Uh, the first thing is I said fluency in English. Notice I did not say a native English speaker. Um, this is something I see quite, quite uh, regularly, uh, not specifically within horticulture, but just across, across recruitment in general. Um, if you put in native and English, you run the risk of um, falling foul of uh, discrimination um, because somebody who may be fluent in English but not native can feel like they've been discriminated against. So I would always recommend if English is a necessity for your role, just leave it as fluency in English, you know, um, you, don't, you don't need to specify they need to be native or not. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is something that I find quite useful is the last point. So the full right to work in the Republic of Ireland, um, so no sponsorship available. Um, this is obviously a specific case. Um, if you have sponsorship, that's a different story altogether. Um, but by and large, the roles that I typically end up working with, it would mostly be a w without sponsorship. So I find having that little caveat there at the bottom, um, it just helps, you know, justify, you know, why I may not want to speak to some people if they need 
sponsorship because you may not be able to afford a sponsorship. You may not be eligible to give that sponsorship. Um, so that, that can be quite a useful thing to have in your job ads. And then this is the third and final part of the particular role. So this is the job benefits. Um, so I always phrase it as job benefits. You know, this is what you can get, excuse me, while working with us. So it's again, just a little thing saying, we believe everybody should know what you expect when applying for a role. This is what you can expect if you are offered at Horticulture Connected, if you're successful. So before they even, before I've even spoken to these candidates on the phone, they already know what to expect. You know, uh, they already know exactly what the pay is, you know, 15 pounds per hour, um, you know, full support for remote, uh, for remote working. So no from remote working, they know they'll be given a mobile phone, they know that they'll be given the opportunity to grow um, a part of the business and taking on additional responsibilities. So they know that this role has career progression. Um, and then one, one thing I always put in is training as required, because especially in a smaller business, um, you know, new challenges come up all the time. Um, so you need to make sure that you are, um, you know, updating skills as needed. Um, and the last part is um, just my call to action. No, so for the right person, this is a great opportunity to grow your career in a booming sector. And if you believe you are that person, apply now. So the reason why I have that there is again, just to prompt that person. So that person has gone on a journey, you know, that we, 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 we led them along and they're at the point now where they're going to make a decision whether or not they're going to apply. So we want to encourage that person to apply. You know, even if that person's not ultimately suitable, they may be suitable for another role down the road, or they may be, or they may have connections with other people. So it's always better to have people apply than not apply. Um, that, that's always my, my, my own personal opinion on that. So the next thing we're going to have a look at is uh, brand awareness. So I touched on this before. Um, this is very much uh, becoming uh, uh, are very much uh, becoming a large part of recruitment. Um, the reason being is people are becoming more invested in their own values and they want their own values to match the people that they're working with. So one thing I found quite often within horticulture is sustainability, for example. Um, so we have people who only want to work with clients who have um, who specifically promote sustainability, environmental factors, and so on and so forth. Um, another very common one is work-life balance, as I've mentioned before. Um, so work-life balance, it could mean, you know, maybe more flexible working hours. It could be, you know, you have very strict hours, you know, you're, you start at seven, you finish at four, and that's it, you know, no overtime or, or what have you. Um, or it could mean you know, no weekend. It, it just it obviously just depends on specific, you know the specific circumstance. Um, but I would definitely recommend for you to think about you know how can you incorporate you know the values of the people who are applying for your role, um, whether that be sustainability, environmental issues, or maybe it could be project excellence, um, you know safety or what have you. Um, or it could be looking at ben or, sorry, um, you know, better life work balance, you know, how, how, how all that would incorporate into how you are as a company. The reason why that's so important is because before anybody has even looked at your ad, 90% of candidates have made up their mind about your brand before they've even applied to you. So, but, so you have no control or you have very little control over changing people's minds once they have engaged with you or in this in some cases not engaged with you so in order to widen you know the the, the net as it were making sure you encapsulate as many candidates as possible um you need to start thinking about your brand like i was saying before and how that lines up with the values of the people who you are looking to attract um to your company so this is again, come back to what I was saying before, you know, your brand is vital to attracting the best talent in the market. And uh, the reason why this is so important is without good staff, your business, your business will fail. You know, there's just no, no two ways about it. You know, um, if, if, uh, if I have a bad salesperson, my business will fail. If I have a bad writer, my business will fail. If you have a bad um, horticulturist, your business will fail. Um, if you can't attract the talent to you, you know, as time progresses, you know, as you have natural attrition within your business, your business will ultimately shrink and collapse in upon itself. Um, so being aware of your brand is 
vitally important to making sure that you succeed as a business or give yourself the best chance of succeeding as a business. Um, so this can be done through a variety of different ways. The traditional way these days, that's a bit weird saying that, but the, the, common, the common consensus these days is uh, through social media. So this can be done through Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, TikTok, whatever. You know, you're just engaging with people and, you know, telling them about you. Because if you think about it, you know, the people who you want working for you, um, they're already working, right? You know, because they're the best at what they do. So when they're ready to make a move, whatever reason, whether it could be a better like work balance, better salary, you know, maybe a better location, um, you know, it, you've been at the forefront of their mind, you know, because you're working on so many exciting projects, because you're promoting, you know, a uh, better work-life balance. Um, you know, when they're ready to make a move, they will specifically look at you and maybe approach you directly. Say, hey, I'm looking to make a move. Um, this is what I can do. Are you, are you interested in conversation? You know, so that's like social recruiting. Um, and it's becoming increasingly popular um, and also increasingly important because people like I said before, are becoming a lot more um, a lot more picky about where they work. Um, so if you can make sure that your values are lining up with what people are are, are looking to um, uh, be associated with, that will just increase the amount of candidates who will be interested in having a conversation with you. Another thing is your website. Um, so I'm going to specifically talk about landscape architects in this in this capacity, um, but this is applicable to 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 all parts of horticulture. Uh, but in particular with landscape architect, I find that because it's so visually orientated, you know, um, because they're obviously looking to attract clients and everything else, um, it, it, they can sometimes forget about um, the stuff that can attract candidates. Um, because you can show a really pretty garden, you know, really pretty, you know, uh, lawn or, um, you know, a landscape, and, um, and, and that will attract clients, which is absolutely important. Um, but sometimes you might want to think about, you know, what will attract candidates? You know, what would they appreciate that clients might might not necessarily appreciate? It could be like a separate tab altogether on your website. You know, it's like, oh, if you're interested in this kind of work, you know, this is the kind of technical stuff um, that that we work with that that, that can engage with people um, that way. That's just something to think about. You know, think about, you know, even though your, your website is very much geared towards clients, you know, th still think about how it can attract potential candidates towards you as well. And, and last, by no means least, you know, it's obviously your reputation in the marketplace. You know, if you have a brilliant reputation, a stellar reputation for treating your workers well, you know, for listening for what they want, um, people will want to work with you. You know, um, it, there's no two ways about it. You know, that it, there's a reason why, you know, word of mouth is still king. Um, so that, that's just something to also bear in mind. Um, so this is this is something that I had a conversation with my colleagues about uh, before coming on here, and we were kind of hemming and hawing about whether or not to put it in. Um, but eventually, I had decided that it was something that we absolutely should. So I already discussed what uh, onboarding was. You know, somebody who comes in and uh, they, they know exactly what we expect of them when they start. Um, offboarding is a relatively recent. Um, I don't want to say phenomenon because it's not quite correct, but it, there's been a, a shift and people are now focusing on it a little bit more. Um, so let me just explain what it is and why you should care about it. Um, so offboarding is when somebody is leaving, um, for whatever reason, you know, it could be it could be for a permanent reason or it could be temporary, you know, like uh, paternity or maternity or, or what have you. Um, but they're leaving for whatever reason, and you just have a sit down with that person. You know, you find out well, why is it you're looking to leave? You know, well, what could we have done better? You know, in order to keep you, um, you know, and sometimes you know people are leaving for reasons that are just beyond your control. But nine times out of ten, there are reasons why you can um, do, um, you know, what what why you can um, Im improve what you're doing. You know, and sometimes it may just be an outlier. You know, it might just be something that didn't work for that particular person, or you may find a pattern. You know, and uh, this comes back again to, you know, your social branding, you know, what's your reputation in the marketplace, you know, because these people, you know, uh, they're going to go out, you know, and for better or worse, they're going to become your brand ambassador. You know, they're going to either recommend or not recommend um, wh where it is that you should work. 
Um, you know, so if you have a reputation for not fixing problems, you know, for ignoring things um, or being oblivious to what's going on, um, that person, you know, uh, when they leave, if you haven't offboarded them correctly, um, they will, um, you know, they, they will badmouth you essentially, you know, in, in the marketplace and in, in, in such a candid poor market, which is what, what I've touched on before, um, you know, what goes around does indeed come around. Um, but let me just briefly explain what a candidate poor market is. So it, it's fairly intuitive in that um, a candidate poor market is where there are more jobs than there are skilled candidates for those jobs. So horticulture is prime example. You know, there are just simply not enough, you know, good skilled workers to fill the job that we need in the horticulture industry. You know, it's been like that for ages. It's getting more and more difficult now to do this um, as, a com as, the, as the competition intensifies. Um, so this, this is something that can really help offset that um, because, you know, people leave anyway, regardless, you know, due to life, you know, um, personal circumstances and there's always just going to be natural attrition. Um, but if you can offset that, you know, by building up your brand ambassadors, you know, the people who are leaving, um, you know, and they can help promote your business, um, that can help, again, increase the amount of candidates um, who can come uh, to you for uh, potential employment. Um, so I believe that is everything very briefly. Um, I hope you found that useful. I do believe Connor has... Um, has uh, been recording while I've been speaking. So if you missed anything or if I spoke a bit too quickly for you, I'm sure that uh, you'll be able to catch it up as needed. Thank you very much for that, Sam. That was uh, a very interesting uh, talk and, and discussion, uh, very insightful into the recruitment side of horticulture. Uh, there's just a few questions here. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the general atmosphere on the ground uh, with horticulture businesses and recruiting staff? Are they optimistic, pessimistic, skeptical about fighting staff, or what is what's happening out there at the moment? So, being brutally honest, I'm skeptical, and uh, they, people are struggling. Um, you know, and uh, and I that's what I was touching on uh, towards the end of our discussion there. Uh, people are people are struggling to find uh, new, new new staff. Um, what, one of the things that we're doing at Horty Recruit uh, to help improve that is not only conversations like these with clients, but also conversations with universities, you know, what, what they can do to help improve, you know, people, um, you know, going into the workforce, you know, what, 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 are, what are employers looking for, what, what, what's realistically, what can they can realistically expect of our graduates coming in. Um, having said that, I do, I do find that uh, right now people are excited. You know, just uh, cause people, you know, restrictions would mean ease. People are kind of, you know, you know, spring, spring is kicking in. So p people right now are 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 looking forward to kind of get getting on with it. And I find, and one thing I want to highlight, actually, I, I I didn't mention this before, is when you are speaking to candidates, you know, speak to them about how busy you are. You know, tell them about you know how busy you are for twenty twenty one. If you're booked up, tell them that. You know, because if if they're unsure about leaving their current job, you know, because of uncertainties, you know, with everything that's going on, if you can reassure them that, um, you know, you're busy, you need them to work with you, you know, you have a permanent position for them, that will help ease candidates that bit me, that bit much bit easier. Yeah, yeah, very good. And do you see any kind of common trends in regards how hard businesses are recruiting staff, any kind of common pitfalls that they're doing or maybe common positivities that they're doing? The um, so, so that brings up two things I wish every horticulture business will do. Um, so the first thing is definitely job ads. I've gone through that already in length. Um, but the second thing is um, salaries. So I actually did a poll earlier on today, just specifically on salary. So in this particular poll, I asked people, you know, if you had two identical jobs, and they had interviews at the exact same time, um, but one had a salary, you know, attached to it, so you knew exactly what the salary was, and the other one didn't, but you could negotiate it. Um, as of, you know, right now, 80% of those candidates would go for the, the one with the salary on it, and 20% would go for the salary without it. So you 
are potentially missing out on 80% of your candidates, um, you know, to your competitors if you do not put your salary on, um, on your, on your uh, job ad. Um, in terms of positivities, um, I do find people are getting more into um, the social aspect. Um, it could definitely be ramped up a bit more, but I do find that's definitely improving. Yeah, and uh, one final question. You touched on brand awareness in relation to horticulture businesses. Do you feel mm -hmm. that there's a trend in regards candidates creating brand awareness and creating a kind of a portfolio of their work to show to people and, and using social media to show off basically? Or... Um, yes, so I, I, I find that candidates, you know, when, when they're really engaged with the business, you know, they're really proud of what to do, okay? Um, so they're, they're taking pictures, you know, they're, they're talking about it on Instagram, you know, the amount of blogs I've seen that's cropped up, you know, on Pinterest, on, um, on Instagram and everything else, you know, where, where they're just highlighting their work. Um, I, I would definitely encourage, you know, um, employers to keep encouraging that and just have their, you know, their kind of say, hey, you know, you just did, you just did this at work, would you mind just tagging us in it? um and, and stuff like that because that adds just this whole level of authenticity that you just can't buy um and that really helps promote your brand yep and there's just one final one came in there in relation to women in horticulture uh what okay. do you think is the ratio in 2020 and 2021 is there an increase in... um there's been there has been an increase um i wish it was a bit more um you know i i, I do believe um you know that, that that it should be more purely because it just means more people we can work with um you know i, I know traditionally speaking you know um Horsch has been very much dominated by men um you know due to the work involved but um obviously we're in the 21st century now women can be just as uh, capable as men um in certain in, in certain positions so it's uh it, it's definitely something to think about i don't think anybody should ever be ruled out obviously um just because of sex you know, again going back to the whole nine protected characteristics um you never want to do that um but you know if it by, by increasing the amount of women involved in horticulture regardless of whereabouts in horticulture you're just increasing the workforce and it's just making it that much easier for everybody to get the job they need their you know they need to get done yeah yeah uh kieran do you have any questions or anything you would like to add there i think you're music kieran Thanks for th thanks very much, Sam, for an inspirational talk, and you can, you can clearly see that you're passionate about your 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 topic. I would just like to uh, quiz you on references on, on okay. the use of references. Uh, is it um, word of mouth versus written, and also the scenario of somebody's looking for if if I know a person that brings me up and say, what do you think of Connor? And I, I could be glad to get rid of Connor and give a, a, a reference to say, you know, he, he's not a bad fella. You know, it's just how do you handle, interpret the whole reference, uh, play it out? Um, OK, so, so so I'll do this in a, in, a, in a specific scenario situation and I'm going to throw you a little bit under the bus, Connor, and I apologize in advance. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But uh, no, so references, I, I, I don't take written references. I think I said that before already, uh, purely because they're, they're just so easy to fake. Um, and they generally don't really tell me anything. Because um, a reference for me is more about, you know, sense of character. You know, um, so it's, you know, how does this person interact with other people? Because I already know, technically speaking, you know, are they able to do the job? They should be able to do that. Um, coming back to what you said, uh, Kieran, um, it, it is a, it is tricky. You know, um, you know that's why I always take more than one. Um, you know, I take I take a couple. I, ideally, I take three. Uh, two is usually okay. You know, if if you're getting conflicting, if you're getting conflicting, um, you know, opinions after two references, like right, you take a third. You know, you have to take a third. You know, to confirm the majority. Um, so that that's usually how you would alleviate that 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 sort of risk um you know by just taking more than one reference so for example if i was taking on connor and i gave you a bus say hey what can you tell me about connor you know would you rehire him yes 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 would. yes great like okay that sounds good and then i'll have a chat with whoever connor worked with before um you know before yourself and see does that tie up with uh, what you said and if it does great if it doesn't i then get a third one to uh, confirm one way or the other 
So you'd just pick up the phone and ring me mm -hmm. and ring the you just pick up the phone and that's it. Yeah. Without even um, you wouldn't even know you wouldn't even know the person or nothing. You just pick up the phone and ring. Oh yeah. Well no, in, in this case uh, Connor has given me the reference no, and he's uh, told Oh yes, yes, yes. 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 So, right. so I, I I wouldn't know I actually wanna uh, sorry, I, just, I made an assumption I shouldn't have. I would never ever ever call for a reference at a current place of employment without the candidate's permission. Never. Um so Let's say, for example, Connor wanted to work with me, but he's still currently working with you, Kieran. Um, I would uh, I'd say to Connor, hey, I'm looking to make you an offer pending references. Can, can I call your current place of employment? Um, if he says yes, I'll go give a call. If he says no, like, hey, that's understandable. And give me two other references for me to have a chat with. So I chat with them um, and ask you, you know, the question. So that should, again, sidestep, um, you know, if you're looking to get rid of Connor, you know, um, you know, it should start that, that uh, particular issue as well, because I'm not talking to you directly. That makes sense. It, it, that makes a lot of sense, uh, and that's good information. That is good information. I just, I don't know. I, I'm uh, throwing in a, a, a question, thinking outside the box now. Mm -hmm. You know, what's mm -hmm. the uh, the common uh, horticultural wage for uh, an industrial person, say, walking in down where you are, Sam? It's a fair question, you know. I know it depends uh, on the job, on the craft level, on the skill level. Um, I, 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 so, so that brings up a bit of a thorny issue, um, you know, and I, I want to say this with as much tact as I can, um, you know, because I, I worked in both the, the Scottish market and also the London market as well, previous to working in Dublin. Um, so I know there's massive discrepancies uh, w w within uh, the UK, but traditionally speaking, um the 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 northern ireland does pay less uh, than for the same job down south um cost of living is obviously higher down here so that needs to be factored into into um into situation but you know if like to give you an example um if uh, somebody who is a you know a specialist you know um you know whether that's in horticulture or landscape or something like that you're talking minimum thirty five thousand euro plus um annually of course you know that's gross not net um so that can be a sort of ballpark that's probably on the that's like i said minimum um i've been placing people kind of plus that you know up to 40 um you know up to forty thousand. uh but for those kind of 45 is not not uncommon either um for if you're looking for some more unskilled labor um, you know, whether, and even then unskilled labor is become more expensive because it's, it's, it's about reliability now. You know, if you have somebody who's reliable, you'll pay for that person. You know, if you know that person will show up when you need them to show up, um, you know, you'll pay for that. You know, that could be easily, you know, 12, 13, 14, you know, an hour, um, very, very easily. Um, so that, 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 that's probably the best synopsis I can give you of the market down here at the moment. Thank you. That's all, Sam. Thank you. Yeah. So that's that's all the questions, Sam. Um, thank you again for the presentation and answering uh, the questions. And I would like to thank everybody for for joining us tonight as well and uh, listening into the webinar. Um, if you have any questions after the webinar, you can get in touch with us and we can pass on the questions on to Sam. So um, thank you all very much, and we'll wrap it up with that. Sure. Thank you, okay. Sam. Thank bye, you. Connor. Bye bye. Yeah. No.